Welcome everyone to our today's webinar on Accelerate the Path to, data, to Database Log with Data Science. Our today's speakers are Brent Mayers, Philip Rose, and David Molina, who will certainly say more about themselves during the session. The session will last about 90 minutes, and of course, during the presentation, you can ask questions by putting them in the question box. And after the presentation, our speakers will try to answer them. And that's all from my side. I'm very pleased to welcome you all, and I wish you a good session. Thank you. Good morning, uh, clinical data managers and clinical data scientists. This is uh, Brent uh, from Brevity Signals, and I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Welcome and thank you. Um, uh, we're excited that you're here today and join this conversation. Uh, this group we have on the webinar today is passionate about uh, using technology to help uh, solve clinical data challenges. Um, our, our organization spans um, research discovery and uh, the clinical, but uh, today you've, you've got a breadth of talent here um, uh, to help uh, discuss uh, analytics, data science, and uh, clinical development. So, again, I'm, I'm Brent. Um, I'm out, I'm out in uh, Portland, Oregon, Pacific Northwest of the United States. And our goal today is to line up uh, with uh, SCDM's excellent Clinical Data Science 101 course, and then really describe specific examples of uh, data science and action today, um, and also describe the characteristics of what will help you on your clinical data science journey. And I said, you know, we, we're going to make this a, uh, we'll pause for polls, you know, we'll go straight to a poll here now and really bring you into the conversation. So we want to get some feedback from you uh, and then we'll go into an anecdote. So uh, poll question number one, um, where are you on your data science journey um, for uh, data management? Um, you know, you can pick as many options as you like. Um, are you at the beginning? Are you trying a different approaches? Um, uh, do you have technology to support you in this sort of in, in your data science journey? Um, or are you just here to, uh, you know, are you here to, uh, you're looking for ways to learn more? Pause here for, for a bit. All right, so I see the uh, the results up. Um, you know, I think we've 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 landed uh, we've we, you've all landed in the right spot. You know, hope we can uh, teach you some more today, and um, hopefully, uh, when you can provide us some feedback for those you that responded with trying to uh, trying a few new approaches, hopefully you can sort of tell us what what you've learned and what works and maybe what we're missing here. Um, uh, so the rest of us can learn, but uh, uh, clearly uh, we'll have a, a variety of you, uh, a variety of sort of uh, ideas and experiences to share for those who entered uh, A or D, so who are still trying to learn. Um, and I'd be curious to learn more about sort of what what platforms you might be using as well, um, to see sort of what those characteristics are of, of those platforms that are really helping you. So uh, let's start with an anecdote, right? So. Um, to personalize sort of like what, uh, you know, what shapes sort of our, our, uh, our approach to clinical data science here at Revity Signals. Um, so uh, I, I've been in the technical leadership roles for 21 years, analytics for 15 years, and clinical 13 years, just so you can know where I'm coming from. And my career actually started completely outside clinical data science, um, but in, in, in air traffic control. And sort of the reason I bring that up, right, is it taught uh, clear and concise communication that is auditable, right? Uh, when you're controlling aircraft, it's all about um, being very sharp and to the point, but also um, uh, keeping record of, of who did what and why. Um, and that really sort of was formative in shaping, uh, you know, collaboration um, in, in, uh, in a lot of the work that I've done over, over my career. Uh, moved into uh, uh, working at a variety of, of, of CROs, um, and they uh, really, you know, the, what came to that is, is the ability to adapt to to changing questions, right? 
an ever-changing number of data sources, regulations, and technologies, right? And being able to have a data source that, that adapts to that was critical. You know, don't be invested in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a system uh, that is monolithic, has a monolithic model um, or limit the structure on you, right? Or, or cannot really uh, scale uh, with the five Vs, right? That, that we that we keep professing through um, SCDM, right? Volume, variety, velocity, veracity, and value, right? Your data, your data management solution really should be able to scale and sort of adapt to uh, the changes with the industry. And then uh, uh, most currently, right? in a variety of sort of consulting and sort of product uh, management roles across the industry, right? Work with all size biopharma and CROs, um, but uh, really uh, the, the, the key element there is to be able to have an analytics capability that allows you to adapt also to not just the role, but the questions that keep being asked um, that allow you to dive deeper and deeper, but also sort of giving um, sort of workflows too. So now let's talk about Data science, right? Let's let's just let's be very uh, let's start to start with the, the basics and say um, it's really all about um, uh, meaningful insights, right? You know uh, how uh, uh, in the end it's it's how do I achieve uh, data quality when there's too much data to review, right? Um, uh, guidance has been has been created to sort of create this narrowing funnel where where to focus your time. And data science really is a mechanism to help you really adhere to sort of uh, regulatory guidance. Um, so really let's talk about the guidance first and go back to sort of you know, the, the, the definition here, right? And ICH uh, E6R2 defines quality, right? And ICH E8R1 defines essential activities, which then leads to sort of your critical, uh, critical to quality factors. You know, this helps shape protocol design, feasibility, safety, conduct, reporting, engagement. Um, really, this is where data science comes into play, right? How do you monitor, document, and address risk, right? Um, and ultimately, there's a spectrum of data science or analytics, you know, and really the goal is to sort of hide the complexity through simple workflows that we'll talk about today, um, but also uh, uh, help show how uh, these analytics or data science came to uh, the conclusions that they did, right? To be able to sort of uh, give you the underlying sort of rationale, again, to help guide you. And really, um, how else can data science help, right? Automate tasks, such as data mapping, coding, queries, and identifying uh, SAEs. But in the end, as it says here in the bold letter, or the bold words on the left, right? It's really about extracting meaningful, meaningful insights. You know, don't let, um, uh, I, I think this is sort of well covered in the, SCDM's Data Science 101 course as well, in that uh, this is not an, an attempt to uh, uh, ex uh, overwhelm you um, with uh, statistics. So let's further demystify, right? So nothing to demystify sort of a topic like taking a, a childlike approach and just, just being curious, right? And, and in my case, this means doodling, right? And design thinking circles, uh, doodling or just drawing can help generate and communicate ideas. Um, really, data decisions and people. All three are essential sort of in the data science uh, realm, right? Uh, data, it all starts here. Um, in this case, right, I've, I've doodled five blobs, if you will, um, showing the endless changing number of data sources, right? The volume, variety, and velocity of, of the five Bs, right? Um, this comes down to data access, right? Um, uh, Revenue signals we prescribe to the FAIR data principles that we'll define a little bit more later to help achieve these access, right? Decisions, right? In some cases, you're following a workflow for a repeatable task. Um, this is similar to an analyst role uh, with a broad and shallow analysis. In some cases, you need to dig deeper or dive into an exploratory analysis. This is not unlike a data scientist, right? Um, in either case, you need the technology that helps you adapt to achieve both. And this capability should help keep an audit record of actions. People, no function in clinical trials is accomplished in a vacuum, right? Um, multiple functions, departments, and vendors are employed, and you need a tool that can help you uh, communicate in one location in line with your analyses, right? Um, you've, you've, met, you've come to an insight, but then you need to be able to communicate directly on top of that insight um, what your decisions are to other folks. Um, so 
now let's talk about the center of the diagram a bit more, right? Let's discuss some of the common decisions and analysis uh, questions that come uh, from within uh, clinical data management. How many of these questions are familiar to you? Uh, I'm sure you could fill a few more slides with similar questions. Um, but these are the top five we hear from our uh, clinical data management groups that we work with, right? And sort of some of the adjacent groups too. Um, I would submit uh, that uh, they are clear problems in search of data science principles we just discussed, right? For example, how many of you are hamstrung by waiting for access to data, right? So you know, upper left here. Um, be waiting, uh, you know, are you waiting for sort of an, another internal group or an external vendor then only to have to do more work to get the data into a format that you need. Um, missing forms or missing data. There are numerous visualizations or simple analytical methods that can help identify missing data. Um, and also models for predicting and, uh, and also predicting sort of missing uh, data offenders, right? Which sites or forms are the sort of, uh, are, cons are consistently the last to be completed or just generally missing data. Really, but today we'll focus on the bottom two here, right? Um, uh, progress to database lock and compliance with FDA validator rules, right? We'll just sort of define both of those as well, right? So let's talk process first, right? It, it starts with data access. Uh, time relevant data access, you know, having it refreshed and, and means uh, that uh, you're, not, you're not waiting for the next cut of data. Um, and then you want a summary that allows you to hone in on the most important issues, right? So you just think of it as a funnel and you want to look at sort of all the data in a, in a that helps you succinctly sort of identify the uh, the most critical areas, right? So this should be guided by your critical to quality process or your risk-based indicators that you've, that you've already um, sort of created sort of earlier on um, in, in your study creation, right? From there, you'll need to drill down to raw data and view relationships across domains. Perhaps again, Having a dashboard to reference your data review status or metrics, like long cycle times, to uh, further focus in on essential data. And finally, the ability to sort of communicate your findings and maintain uh, an audit record of your decisions. So here's a simple sort of screen capture of, of our database lock dashboard summary page, right? So this is sort of one of the, the higher level ones that sort of gives you a snapshot of, 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 of your progress to database lock, right? Um, it clearly focuses your attention on data completeness and query status in a variety of different ways. From there, you can drill down, right? This is just sort of the entry point to help focus your energy. Um, and this is but one example, right? This can be tailored to your, your specific study or your specific questions. But um, really the key thing here is, is that it's just uh, a simple way to help digest and, and focus on the critical and essential data. Let's discuss, one, let's discuss one more example, right? Um, following the release of, F, of the FDA's validator rules uh, uh, 1.6, uh, we released a dashboard that allows the dynamic drill down into compliance with these rules, right? And facilitate action. Like the last example, it starts with data access. Um, refresh frequently, right? You need to have that current data. Um, and then you need to have a summary page that focuses your time and then drill down into non-compliant uh, data. Uh, and then you need to reference those data with data review processes and ultimately record your decisions and actions, right? So be able to compare, uh, has action already been taken on this? You know, how, you know, how frequently has the data, how frequently has the data changed, right? Being able to look at that audit record of the data, but then communicating to the relevant parties, your safety team um, or others, um, where you stand on, on your decisions and see what their decisions were. So we'll spend a lot of time here because you'll see more of this analysis in a few minutes live, right? Um, our superb colleague, David Molina, will give you a live demo of this, but um, I'll, so I'll leave the bulk of it to, uh, to David. But the primary takeaway here um, is that you should see uh, a, uh, a, on the left, starting on the left-hand side, the FDA rule number, right? And then the description next to it, just to the right. And then keep going further to the right, you're seeing a variety of red and green blocks, you know, parsed out by domain, right? And the, the, the red ones here are identifying those rules by domain 
that are, are not compliant, right? And then you can click on it and then sort of drill down further, right? And again, David will show you more about this and sort of the configurability with it. So, uh, you know, let's go back to where we started, right? Data decisions and people. How can they be tied together? Uh, and how, how can they be tied together um, is what enables really data science for clinical data managers. Um, from a technology perspective, um, all clinical data together, refresh so you're not waiting for others, right? Uh, next, you want analytics that are relevant to your role and can scale with, you, with, with uh, your questions and the five Vs, right? Lastly, you want integrated collaboration that allows you to ditch spread, get rid of spreadsheet trackers or email and have a complete audit record with your analysis in one place. Ultimately, in the end, um, uh, we're gonna, we, we, it's, it's more important to get into sort of a, an actual example, right? So uh, before we actually get into what this, uh, you know, a, a live example with David, um, we'll, we'll jump over to another poll again to get your, um, your, your voice into this process um, and to uh, uh, really see, uh, get, your, get your take, right? So how do you manage your FDA data validation process, right? You should see a poll um, opening up for you, right? Are you uh, manually tracking it? All right, you have some sort of spreadsheet system or are you uh, emailing? Um, probably both of those if you're doing the spreadsheet. Um, or do you have a data-driven data process that allows you to sort of drill down? So we'll pause here for you to uh, uh, submit your feedback and then we'll, we'll discuss it for brief, uh, briefly and then I'll hand it over to my colleague, uh, David, here for that demo. All right, we'll give it a few more moments here. There we go. Uh, all right, so, yep, well, pretty pretty evenly split here, but uh, clearly, you know, as expected, uh, spreadsheets um, uh, is, is our winner. Um, and again, that, 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 that's, you know, that jives up pretty well with, with our experiences across our customers. Um, and, um, you know, I think it obviously lines up obviously along with sort of manual processes. Um, and I hope what we, what we, we, you know, some of what we show today will help uh, give you ideas again about characteristics of what you should be looking for, what, of what can get you sort of away from that. Um, and, you know, uh, hopefully we can hear a little bit more about, uh, from you about what those, what the challenges you are have. I mean, maybe, maybe the spreadsheets are working for you, but generally the folks we talk to are not happy with the, the, uh, the spreadsheets, uh, system. Um, but I would be curious to hear from that 40% that also has their own sort of data driven processes, um, and how that, and how you, uh, and, and how, what, again, what characteristics of, of the tool that you use, um, drove you towards that tool. Um, so that said, uh, let me hand it over to my colleague, David, who's going to give you a, a live demo of this dashboard. David, are you all set? Absolutely. Thank you, Brent. Perfect. And let me share my screen right here. If I'm correct now, everyone should be seeing the FDA validation dashboard. Well, before we start uh, with the demo, let me present myself. Hello, everyone. My name is David Molina. I'm a senior business analyst and developer here at Revit Signals. I'm really, really excited for what I'm going to show you. Um, in multiple projects, I've worked in a lot of projects with Brent, with Philip, my colleagues over here, and with a lot of other people, right? and especially with customers and people, other people in Revity. And with all of them, we have created amazing projects. But for this one, I'm really, really excited. We have been working on uh, with a lot of customers for, uh, for this specific um, dashboard, for this specific solution, right? As Brent was telling you, one of the key questions in data management 
is what do we do with the FDA validations? What do we do with those FDA rules that all of us, all of us, we need to comply to, right? We need to comply or those rules uh, and the data needs to be complying on them, right? They need to follow them. So there is no way around for us. We always need to be checking on them. And something that I've, we've been coming up, right? The conclusion that we have come up with when we are talking with our customers is that the sooner we can start doing this type of analysis, the better, right? What does this mean? What does this mean? When we talk about the sooner we can do this analysis, the better. Well, this is very, very easy. What this means is that sometimes, and in a lot of other tools, in a lot of other dashboards, you'll analyze and you'll see the data, but you can only use data that is already SDTM standardized. Okay? And that's a big problem. That's a big problem. Because what if you need to start doing your analysis way, way before, and you only have EDC data? Well, what, that's one of the key points that we have in this specific template, when we're having this specific solution. Because we, are, we get that data, that's something you don't even see, it's made from the background. We get that EDC data, not standardized data, and we are able to work with that. We're able to work with that data. Not only we work with that data, but we also know that just as life is about uh, people, and relationships, data is about relationships. So, so we understand, we understand the value that it has in for the data in our clinical data. That is to make every single domain talk to each other, to be understanding of each other, to know that the information that every single domain is connected between them, right? Just as an example, we all know most or most of us, we will know over here that when we're doing our clinical data analysis and when we're doing our data management analysis, it's very, very important. This is one of the FDA rules before I even start showing you this, is that we need to check, we need to confirm that the date of death, for example, it has to be the last date. It has to be the last date. Uh, the date of start of dosing, the date of end of dosing, all of those days, the days of screening, all of that has to come before. And we provide this type of analysis with this solution. The first thing you're gonna come and see here is that we give you a very, very general um, visualization. What you're seeing here is just a standard bar chart. It's showing, but it, it, this standardized, this green, and red coloring is what you're going to see to identify and to understand everything in this dashboard and in this specific solution that we have created uh, for all of some of our more valuable customers. You'll see that it works very, very easy. It's very fast to understand. It's very intuitive. So the first thing you're going to see here in this specific dashboard is a big green uh, bar chart and a red bar, okay? What this means is that everything that is in green, it's the rules are compliant. The FDA rules are absolutely compliant and everything that is in red, is not compliant. We need to work on that, okay? So at this, as we can see here with this dummy data that we have created for you, we can see that mm, about two thirds, right? About two thirds of the data are compliant. Now you'll ask me, David, this is very good. Now I know that two thirds of the, my data are compliant. How do I work and how do I go from just knowing that two thirds of the data are not compliant to, I mean, to one third of the data is not compliant into seeing those specific lines in a very easy way for me? Well, the first thing that we need to do is to know what are the rules that we're analyzing, right? What are those rules that we're analyzing? So we can come here in this specific, and we can click here on the lower left side on rules and domains. And what will it tell you? It will tell you the rules and the domains that you have, right? It will show you what we're, we are translating. We're translating your EDC data, your non-SDTM data into SDTM domains that then are going to be interconnected. We're going to do that interconnected analysis. And all of these rules 
are the proof that everything is interconnected because we'll see all of these rules say for example uh this specific rule that we have over here it tells you that it's important to analyze the end date against the start date of exposure so if we click over here we can absolutely see at this specific moment in just one click we can see that those domains that are being applied to is not just one domain is the dominant medication domains is your exposures your adverse events your medical history you can see at this point that everything starts to be interconnected right you can see that the rules that matter are connected to the domains that matter okay then you can start and you can check on different rules on different rules in this for example here you can see that the importance of the dosing analysis the, in the dosing analysis you can see in all of the domains that all of this makes sense that all of this is important you can see that it's applying on demographics your communications your exposure and other domains what about if we want to check on the rules that apply maybe on specific domains you can also just come here and check for example here on exposure you'll see that all of these rules when you click on it all of these rules apply to this exposure domain you can tell me, David, this is great, Dave, but I want to see even more. I want to see how it works. I want to see uh, something more specific, something more specific. And that's that's where I'm going to take you. That's where I'm, where I'm going to take you. I'm going to take you now to do a domain analysis. As you can see over here, we have every single domain, every single domain so that you can see everything just in one slide, everything in one page. Here, what I'm showing you in this domain status, you can see every single domain and what's in green is working, what is red are the, are the rules that are not working. So say, for example, here you have your medical histories, right? You have your medical histories. It's gonna tell you already all of those rules that are not compliant when you click here uh, in, the, in, the, in the red side of, the, of this pie chart when it's identified as medical history. And you can go into every single domain, right? And it will show you which rules are working, which, which rules, are not working, right? Which ones are compliant, which ones are not compliant, okay? And so in this case, this allows you to see very, very easily all of the rules that are compliant and those, all the rules that are not compliant, okay? But you can tell me, David, this is not enough. I need more, I need more specificity, right? That's, that's where the sauce of this specific dashboard, that's the sauce of it. And that's what I'm gonna show you right now. So when we come here, we just have to click and go to the validation matrix. Well, you'll see everyone. You come here to the validation matrix and what you'll see is what Brent showed you before. You're gonna see that we have every single rule, very, very detailed, right? It has that rule description, has the rule description, and you have every single domain. So everything that is in white here on all of these cells, the system already knows that you don't that, that you don't care about that the rule doesn't apply there everything that is green means that it's compliant and everything that is red is not compliant right now so the way for you to analyze this the way for you to analyze this is that you just want to very very easily in just two clicks literally just two clicks it's easy as that just two clicks you can come here you click on any cell that is not compliant right now, or if you want to also, you can check on the ones that are compliant, but you can check on the ones that are non-compliant. You click on the one that is of your interest and you click on get table. When you click here on get table, what are you gonna get? Well, instead of getting your adverse events domain with 4,000 rows of data, you're just gonna get your adverse events table with 16 rows of, uh, of, with 16 rows of data. Right? We, what are these 16 rows? What is non-compliant? So the system is already thinking for you. It's already seeing all, all of the table and it's telling you, hey, out of your 4,000 rows, these are the ones that are not compliant. Please check them out. And here you can check them out. Here you have the whole table with all the, with everything, with all the data. You can come here, you can select the ones that are of your interest that you're reviewing. And you can select them, you can right click, you can mark them as in progress, you can mark them as query, you can create observations, you can create notifications for, for your peers, and you can tell them, hey, I think something's not working here. Can you please check it out? My, my data validations rules, my FDA 
validation rules is telling me that this is not working on this specific rule. Please check it out. And as you can see, it was so easy. It was so easy. We literally did it in a couple of clicks. And you can do this for the rules that are not compliant, but also what if we want to analyze because every single, every single study is alive, right? Every single study is alive. So what if we want to analyze not what is not compliant right now, but what if we want to analyze the new data that is coming up, right? We want to do that review and that constant review, constant review, constant review. We want to do it fast, and we want to be doing all the time so at the end of the day all you know all the data just doesn't uh, come all together and you know you need to take a bunch of days just to do it you can do it very very constantly very very easily in a couple of clicks you can just come here where it says review status uh, dashboard and you'll see this everywhere you'll see this absolutely everywhere and what on this presentation i'm showing you what i'm showing you right here is very simple what you're seeing here is just every single domain and every single uh, the number of rows that are new on that domain. So say, for example, you, uh, you are in a study, you are in a study, it's a live, new data is coming on, right? In this specific week, you're like, okay, I need to analyze. And you notice that you have, for example, 130 new uh, deaths, right? You have 130 new deaths. So what can you do? You can just click on it, you can select on it, and in then one click, and then on the second click, one click, two clicks, it's easy as that, you will generate, it will take you to that specific uh, table, which is the death table in this case, and it's gonna show you those 130 new rows, that just the 130 that just came up. And now you can analyze these rows to be compliant. You can analyze these rows to be compliant, here you can see in this specific um, in this specific column is showing you uh, all the rules that are applying for these specific domains. You can check on them. You can maybe uh, select on these ones that you're checking on right now. And just as before, you can mark them as in progress. You can mark them as query. You can create notifications for your peers, right? You can start conversations with this. This is very, very powerful to enhance that communication inside uh, for the team, inside the team and for the team, right? And if you really, really like this, um, you're gonna love what Philip has created for you, um, which is where we're going down next, right? Um, I hope you really like this. Now we're going with Philip. Uh, he has some things that are amazing and he, that he has prepared for you. Thank you. Hi, this is Stella Ferros, and uh, thank you, David, um, for that uh, great demonstration of a dashboard that allows, that, that facil facilitates and accelerates your ability to uh, confirm compliance with the FDA validator rules that are being applied on your data after you file it. <clears throat> and um, so at this point, I'd like to go ahead and um, ask another polling question to uh, engage you in the conversation again, if I could. And that is, uh, what other data management dashboards might be useful in your context? So uh, database lock tracking and management, uh, sample tracking and management, query status tracking and management, all of the above. Uh, feel free to, um, when um, the host is able to open the polling to go ahead and select your um, thoughts about what's of greatest interest and greatest usefulness to you. Uh, we are waiting for the poll question. Oh, I'm not seeing it. I'm sorry.
you yeah, Phil, the, the, oh. the, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I felt sorry. The results just came up. You got uh, twenty percent for database lock tracking and management, and you got eight percent for sample tracking and management, and you got seventeen percent for query tracking, uh, query status tracking and management, and then seventy-five percent for all the above. Okay, great. Thank you for helping me out there. I apologize. I couldn't see that. Anyway, uh, let's continue then. Uh, yes, thank you. And um, with the next, <clears throat> so let's take a look at a couple of these examples. You've seen the FDA validation dashboard, which is targeted directly at itemizing the FDA validation rules, associating them with the domains of EDC data that um, pertain to each and generates every day a refreshed dashboard of where you are in addressing those issues and also prov pr provides you with an interface to um, address those issues. This is going to really accelerate your ability to prepare for FDA validation uh, completion uh, for, for submission preparation, perhaps. What's an alternative? Another alternative would be to be able to have a tool that helps you ask what's our progress on the towards the database lock. And so I'm going to speak about this briefly. Basically, it all starts with access to the data. Then it has some technology to show you the status of the various things and then it has an environment where you can record decisions and discussions that are ongoing and audit those. So what might that look like? So Brent shared you something like this. And so what we might be looking at here is that we might be looking at uh, the status of patient data entry at a high level for towards our database lock. And um, we might be even looking at the query status. And again, these are colored to indicate those elements that are more complete, uh, not as complete or least complete. And so uh, you can actually set the, the thresholds for these things so that uh, it's either exquisitely sensitive. And if you have one outstanding case, you're, you have like klaxons going off or more usefully, you have the appropriate risk thresholds chosen for your project that allow you to have a good high level status of information about uh, where you are in that process. But that's by itself not very useful. So what you really want to do then, as David shared with the other dashboard, with the validation dashboard, uh, is can you drill down into the details and start to get some information, more information? So this has one row per patient, and what it is showing is the number of submitted forms for that patient. It's showing the percent STV pending for that patient, thankfully all small, so maybe later in the study. If this is all example data, so um, <clears throat> um, the number of queries open, uh, perhaps the percent forms, pending sign off. Um, and this dashboard is going to allow, uh, would allow you to quickly look at where you are in the data cleaning process towards database lock. <clears throat> but what else might you really want in that uh, database lock dashboard? Because data cleanliness is only one part of it. And so remembering, if you would hold in your mind what those tool, what the tool looks like, um, uh, what, what the visualizations allow you to do in your process, maybe in addition to data cleanliness and currency, you might also want to see medical coding status. So um, what is the status of medical coding? How many are complete? How many are incomplete? And uh, <clears throat> perhaps what's the lag time? towards completion. And uh, external lab reconciliation, uh, oh, the ancient, the, the ever-present challenge of trying to deal with uh, not only sample and sample shipment, but uh, with sample results. 
and how can you tell what the level of completion is and track down to where the issues lie in the data as it is coming in and have the system call those to your attention. <clears throat> SAE reconciliation, can you bring in data from your SAE database from the either your outsourcing partner or your uh, uh, SAE database and uh, reconcile those with the adverse event domain? Or could you, in fact, use a dashboard that shows medical and safety data review, the current status of it, and that would be sponsor review, which is now uh, required um, by the FDA. So <clears throat> the, all of these things would allow you to accelerate your processes by focusing your attention, as David showed, on those things that are not complete and being able to drill down to see the details of those things that are not complete so that you're not sifting through a large spreadsheet trying to find them. So let's give one other example here. Um, what is our sample status? And in this case, what I'm looking at here is something where you access your sample data, you look at uh, sample shipment status, for example, you review high-risk samples, samples, and then you record decisions and notify colleagues. Uh, there's a theme going on here in terms of elements of a dashboard that make it more powerful than perhaps just a spreadsheet, more dynamic, and actually, uh, from a data science perspective, perhaps starts to help really provide you a tool to focus your attention where your attention needs to be focused. <clears throat> so here's an example of a sample management dashboard. What we have is the number of samples on the left, and we have three bars. Uh, so the first bar is sample type one, sample type two, sample type three. So each bar is a type of sample. These are the total samples across the study. And what we're coloring is the number of samples that are shipped, which would be a good state, that's complete, and the number of samples that are missing, which is problematic. Again, this is an, an example, <clears throat> but this would be useful as a high level, just entry into where are we with samples. But then you would also want to start getting into the detail. So this is a, a medium level of detail where each section of rows is a subject on the left, each row is a cycle, a visit for that subject. And then there are, in this case, three columns for three different types of samples. So now we're looking not across the study, but per subject, per visit. And we can see we've got problems with subject one, hypothetically, because uh, the, the samples are all missing. Uh, subject two, there's only two missing samples. The rest are all shipped. So just in terms of what we very quickly can focus in here and, and see where the issues lie, but we can't really tell details. What, well, okay, it's missing, but what, what do I need to know about how to uh, query that or look into that? And this detailed view starts to get to this. So each row in this view is of a sample. And for each sample, we have four columns describing the types of sample errors that are being, that are generating the missing versus shipped information. And so we can zero in quickly on where the issue is. Is there a record, record missing in the EDC or in the central lab or in the third party lab data, or is there a sample count error? And we can also look across the visits corresponding to that particular sample so we know which visits are involved and uh, whether what cycle visit it is for the EDC data, the EDC data collection, the third party lab date. And so that approach allows you to really identify those samples that are being, uh, providing you a problem and of course the vendors that uh, are involved in handling them and um, allows you to focus your attention where attention is needed. 
So I'm showing this cartoon again just to refocus our attention on what we're talking about here. We're talking about technical tools that uh, a, a the ability to use your systems to help you drive your processes. You need access to data, you need decisions, analytics, that's what David and I have, and Brent have been showing these examples of, and we need people to be able to collaborate around those decisions to drive decisions. And we need this done in a way that it really focuses our attention where attention is needed. So this cartoon is my attempt to state this in a more general sense. So you need access, analytics, and collaboration. We've been talking about dashboards. Dashboards are one way of doing it. And let's expand what, now that we've done the work of setting up that automated data pool, what else can we do? Well, maybe in addition to dashboards, you can certainly do the dashboards, but maybe in addition, you also have pre-built workflows and customizable analytics. And so, for example, a pre-built workflow might be to establish a workflow to review your adverse events, your safety events, a critical process. And um, you need to identify the domains of data that are needed for that, adverse events, labs, medical history, vitals, daily data. Um, <clears throat> and then, in addition, you might want to make even further use of that data for customizable analytics that perhaps your phys, um, medical leads and uh, uh, statisticians may wish, and, uh, and you as a data scientist may wish to generate and uh, populate and refresh to show information that's emerging in the data. <clears throat> And you want this all wrapped in an environment as always where you can record and communicate decisions and collaborate with your team. So let's take a, a look at that first step. The first step is being able to automate getting access to your data and mapping it. So you may pull in on the left from FTP, EDC, from SDTM. You, you can do this with SDTM, but often that delays your process. And that's why we also so often work with EDC data or with flat files. And um, you have a, a broad array of data sources. You connect to those data sources automatically <clears throat> and you import that data and you unify that data and you access that data. So it's not just that you pull in the data. You also process that data so that it is unified, it is harmonized. The, the columns are renamed to allow the data to stack, I'll say for the, <laughs> hopefully for data managers that makes sense that uh, you want the same column names across different studies, across different cohorts, across different treatments, across, so that as you look at this data, it makes sense and you don't ask a question that has holes in it because um, <clears throat> the best example I can give is if you have an oncology study, some of the studies you're working with will have um, a single tumor and that will not have the tumor type identified in the database because it's in the protocol. Whereas other studies, a basket study perhaps, where you have are looking at multiple tumors, you're going to need a disease diagnosis that indicates the tumor that, for each individual patient. If you query across three or four studies to ask, give me all the patients with tumor X, you're not you're only going to get the ones from the basket study. You're not going to get the one where your uh, your it's a single tumor study, and so you need to unify that data. You need to have a column in your data set or database that allows you to find what tumor is valid for each patient for an oncology program. 
and you need to provide access to this. And by the way, this is all automated. It runs all the time, whenever new data comes in. And then you have access to that for things like the dashboards we're talking about, pre-built workflows, customizable analytics, a collaboration environment that allows you to work with your team. Fair data is um, a concept that comes to us from research. And fundamentally, it just says, we want our data to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. This is a little bit different from traditional data management approaches where the focus is totally on, uh, not totally, is, is primarily on single stream data where you need um, a chain of effort to submit a study. The issue is that because your focus is on SDTM data and filing a study, you haven't done the additional work you need to do to be able to look across studies. And so the idea of fair data is you do that work up front. You, you really, or, or it's an ongoing effort, let's put it that way. <clears throat> So what you want for findability is identifiers that are unique, not only across a study, not only across a patient or a site, but also across multiple studies. So you want site to be unique across, you, not site, you want your subject identifier to be unique across multiple studies. And to do that, you, need your subject identifier perhaps to include elements like study ID, site ID, subject ID. So um, that's a, a case we all know about, but this is, findability is key across all of your data, across your studies, all of your studies in your program. <clears throat> Accessibility, you need role-specific permissions, integrated authentication, and interface to allow you to access the data. Interoperability. This has to do with that unification or harmonization of the data. Can, it, how interoperable is the data model? Uh, if you have, uh, and historically we've had definitions of data that are unique by study because we're focused on following that study, and that's a good thing. But the problem is then when we We've got three or four belts, uh, studies under our belt. We're not able to just look across those four studies and ask a question like, oh wait, what's happening with this rare adverse event? Am I seeing it in every study or whatever? And <clears throat> so you need a vocabulary for your data. Your data needs to be configurable. You need a flexible data model that can actually respond to changes in study design and allow you to um, correctly map and understand that data. And reusability, Here, the, the goal is ultimately not just a single trial, the goal is approval. The goal is a, tra a treatment for patients that is effective. And so ideally you wanna be able to reuse that data without having to assign a fresh team to go back you know, you've got three studies done and you're trying to pull that data together and you put it together a six month project to pull that data together so that you can actually look across the three studies. If you've done this work on an ongoing basis, your data is reusable and you're allowed to use that data for a variety of things, including um, analysis ready data and uh, persona driven analytics workflows across studies or even AI applications of that data, which now work more effectively because you've done some preliminary harmonization. <clears throat> so that data science principle is really key. And let's just restate what this means then. What we've been talking about is that the data manager has a question. You have a question. And you want to think about specific ways so that your systems can, uh, your, your technology can really help you drive that. You want to have access to the current data. 
all the time, fresh, refreshed. Dashboards, analytics, and workflows that are targeted to your specific needs, um, regardless of what they are, um, that, that really focus your attention on those things that need your attention. But also that as you make decisions, you can record those decisions and notify your colleagues and they can record decisions. So in our mind, that starts looking like what I've got on the right here. You need agile data management, you need persona-driven workflows, and you need integrated collaboration. And in our view, this, this describes what you would look for in an end-to-end -end clinical data science program, a platform. <clears throat> it would be a single location where all of your uh, clinical study data resides. It's automatically processed. It's available on a daily basis, refreshed, and it is uh, provides an environment in which you can get your work done in a in an accelerated way using these tools to really focus your attention where you need to focus it. And this is, um, I think, part of the promise of data science for data management. <clears throat> so Gartner has done a, a description of this, and I, I show this because. On the left, we show growth curve for data science. And on the left, it starts with descriptive analytics. Um, I think dashboards are descriptive analytics. This is, this is like scratching the surface. This is like the, the initial steps towards, uh, spreadsheets are a little bit to the left of that. <laughs> but the idea with dash dashboards is actually to start driving it your attention towards those things you need to focus on and <clears throat> tools to help you do that and an environment to help uh, audit that. But then as uh, data science progresses and we w are all working together on this, we're gonna start to find that we might have not only what happened, the description, but also maybe why did it happen? diagnostic analytics or what will happen in uh, if we repeat the experiment, predictive analytics, or how can we make it happen, prescriptive analytics if we're trying to have an AI program help us design a study or something in the future. We can see some real potential here, but I think we are, um, <clears throat> we shouldn't be uh, overwhelmed by this because we, uh, you know, that. This is an ongoing developmental effort to try to make better use of our data as an engine to drive uh, of our data and uh, language for semantic um, uh, AI, <clears throat> generative AI, to drive our processes forward. And um, it is early days, so we can still stay in our more of our historical comfort zone and really focusing on on dashboards and tools that help us work faster those are going to show immediate promise for um, improving our work but uh, in the future we're going to start seeing some interesting opportunities such as what's being done with the impala group where you start asking what should be happening in my data or again developing a more sophisticated tool that is trying to tell us where the risks are in the data. So in this case, these outlier lines that are in the darkest blue on the right uh, might be sites that aren't collecting as many adverse events as we had expected. And that focuses your attention on monitoring the data at those sites. <clears throat> So we are starting to see more and more opportunities for AI, for AI and a few examples are starting to emerge, but, um, but I think there's, there's huge potential for growth in that. We really like to focus on um, data science enablement and how do we help people do their work? How do we help automate processes and assist those using 
uh, technology. And um, analytics, analytics are a really key part of that and a collaborative environment. So as Brent indicated when he opened, um, our company Revity uh, spans the, the whole gamut of pharma and biotech from research all the way through uh, clinical development. And um, <clears throat> so in the clinical space where we've been talking about in purple on the right here, uh, we've been talking about um, clinical research, clinical operations, translational research uh, in the sense of samples. And um, so uh, we find that we, we, we've been doing a lot of work on an end-to-end -end, uh, data science platform and uh, use uh, Signals Clinical. And also uh, we, we extensively leverage the examples you've seen in the uh, demo today were generated with Spotfire. And these tools we find are very powerful in, in getting this work done. I'm sure you uh, also achieve this in other ways, but um, we, in partnering with our, with data managers and others in the pharma and biotech field, uh, <clears throat> are leveraging um, SaaS technologies to try to solve these problems. So, uh, in Signals Clinical, what we're trying to do is pull together data management with automated data refresh and access. <clears throat> Search capabilities, all of your central data, clinical data is centralized and actionable and findable. Analytics that not only show you your data, but actually focus your attention on those things that really need your attention and it's configurable and you can build your own. And collaboration, environment that wraps around all of this work and captures uh, each person's questions, issues, conclusions, decisions um, throughout the processing. And so these, are, these generate uh, or drive reproducible decisions in a centralized analytics platform. So with that, I'd just like to thank you for your attention. Hopefully, we've suggested some approaches that can help to accelerate data management, database lock, FDA validation, a variety of activities that um, data managers take part in. And with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Great. Thank you, Philip. Appreciate you uh, sharing your experiences across your your uh, your entire career, and uh, you know how these technologies can help. I've um, got a variety of uh, questions here. Why you take a, a quick breather, and um, uh, we'll bring bring David in as well. Um, and uh, really, the first question we got here is: uh, Is this EDC or a separate system? Right. This is one of the uh, came came or was in the, earlier on in the presentation, right? But is it is this EDC or a separate system? Um, and I'll I'll, I'll add a, a bit to it, and I'll see if my colleagues have anything else to add. Uh, so this is outside of EDC, right? Um, what you know, what the technology we use is outside of EDC. We're trying to describe more of the characteristics um, of what the of of what uh, technology can help you sort of analyze EDC or and and your and your all the other data that that that, uh, that we have in the space. Um, uh, but yeah, our uh, our technology is um, we call it the Signals Platform, Signals Clinical, and we also employ a Spotfire um, as well uh, for some of the visualization and analytics, um, like what you saw David show. Um, but yeah, this is outside of EDC, um, but it can connect to, to any data source um, and uh, help you map and make and, and standardize all your data into one location for analysis. Um, David, do you have anything else you want to add to that or no? Sure. I mean, I think you, you said it very nicely, right? This is um, the technology that we use. It's not necessarily the data, right? So there's always going to be an intermediate process that in which we can get um, data from multiple places, you know, multiple sources, and they don't even, you know, they, even for us, one same project, you don't even need to have only one data source, 
right? Say, for example, maybe you have your labs, but you, you know, you have uh, local labs that need to get from all of them from different places. And, you know, the, the, standard, the standardization might not be the best. So, you know, you need to do some transformations. You need to do something to that data, right? We work with that. We are able to work with that. So in that case, it's not just EDC data, and it's not just what one uh, data source. You, we can use multiple data sources, and from that, give you your unique solution. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, David. And also, I would just um, reinforce the idea. I, I know historically, data managers, as I was saying, single stream data flow, absolutely, it's a core basic premise. But the problem is that it, your data is not as simple as just data, EDC data. You, you may have your serious adverse event database. You may have your uh, external data repository, uh, or you will have that. You, you have biomarkers, genetics, uh, all, all kinds of data and information that probably doesn't reside in your EDC data set. Plus your EDC data set is typically designed per study and you can't work across studies. It's not really designed for it. So um, data managers, I think, can take the lead in helping to define how we go from source systems like EDC, like the SAE database, towards an integrated database that supports um, analytics, AI, review, because AI is going to be handicapped if you're pointing at an EDC because it is limited to just the data that's in EDC. So this, I, this core concept of access to data into a clinical data science platform is, is a challenging aspect for all of us going forward, I think, to really address how to continue the single stream process, not just through each study, but all the way through the entire clinical program. And, and how do we drive, use that IT then to really drive our processes? Right, that's a key point, appreciate it, Philip. Yeah, it, it certainly can't be uh, uh, running analysis directly on top of an EDC. So, you know, it's, it's uh, key to have uh, you know your, all your data aggregated in one location where you can do those analyses and sort of have access and not have to uh, uh, you know be uh, be stuck with uh, uh, the limitations of analysis that come with an EDC. Um, uh, so let's see next question uh, do you have uh, so this question came in uh, during David's demo right so it's a uh, uh, do you have the same rules for EMA um, you know, I'll, I'll say one piece. Um, uh, the short answer is uh, no, we don't have those rules built into a, a dashboard like the FDA data, data validation rules, um, but certainly that is uh, definitely possible. Um, David, do you have anything else you wanna to add uh, to, to the question? Sure, um, I mean, that's a great question. One part of uh, the FDA, FDA validation uh, dashboard, the FDA validation solution that, you know, that we showed today, is the ability that you have your FDA validation rules, but we what we have seen with our customers, right, is that they will always, you have your FDA validation rules, they will always have like their in-house rules, right? So we have built in the system that set that feeling of customization. We can create uh, customized rules for that. And so, I would say that just as Brent said, it, you, we might not have the, for the EMA right now, but that's absolutely buildable. We can absolutely create it and it's gonna be great and all of our European friends will love it. Yep. Thank you, David. Uh, and the next question, uh, skip down here. Um, uh, we had a comment. Looks like it's a clean patient tracker. I think that came in too during uh, during your demo, David. This looks like a clean patient tracker uh, that we use towards uh, data cleaning. Uh, and I would say that the uh, that that the comment is true. Um, uh, you know, it's a key towards um, cleaning process towards database lock. Yes. 
Um, the next question uh, uh, was uh, sample management dashboard. How is this different from uh, what a typical RTSM does? What's the value add here? Um, I'll, I'll add a comment and then I'll maybe t toss it over to Philip. Uh, you know, I'd say that the, the difference the, here is, you know, there, there's similarities in sort of the, the, the core sort of metrics that you'd be tracking in an RTSM. Um, the difference here is as much as sort of David and Philip described previously, um, you can then have that juxtaposed against any other data that you want, right? Our, the, the, the characteristic of the platform that, that we built and we would profess that you're looking for is now you can then have that, uh, have all your data in one location, right? So as your question, sort of questions, uh, uh, grow beyond sort of what is only available in the RTSM, um, you can, you can have it all in one place. And then the second value add would be, um, as soon as you have to, uh, uh, you know, most RTSMs that, that we, we are exposed to, you know, have, you, they're fixed in terms of what you can look at. So uh, the difference here would be with what we're professing is uh, you want to be able to have the ability to build and add new metrics and questions. As, 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 as your new questions come up, you can build a, a, a new analytic or have that ability to drill down into, into new um, uh, data sources um, or build out again new metrics to help answer those questions um, as you can so it's a very sort of adaptive system uh, is what we're professing um, Philip uh, anything else you yeah. want to add there oh good points Grant and um, <clears throat> you know uh, so I used to work at both Pfizer and Bristol Myers Squibb and um, in the uh, scientific side I've worked with clinicians over the years and um, the quest, uh, the the risk is you may have a really good system for doing something, but it may limit your ability to do things that you aren't really thinking about yet. And I think part of what data science is asking us to do as data managers is to think about what we haven't done yet and how to get there. And uh, part of what we've been trying to talk about is how do you get there? So fundamentally, what, what we've seen is that you need to ask a question. You need to ask, um, oh, I, my system, I need to look at more than just sample shipment. I need to look at the assay results. And I need a system that's going to tell me what percentage of my assay results are compliant with the data model uh, you, you know, were sent correctly. What, what percentage of the assay results are still outstanding, are delayed? And then beyond the operational parts of it, which percentage of the assay results fall within appropriate assay parameters or, or you know, what are the questions? You need to identify what it is you need to track and then design the system to answer those. The analytics, you need to pull in the data that you need, um, in this case, sample assay results perhaps and you need to have a flexible tool that allows you to look at percent completeness delays performance at a, each vendor whatever aspects you might need to ask and then um uh, <clears throat> and then focus your attention on those things that are potential issues and have an environment for capturing decisions and driving queries and and the like whatever actions re remediation actions might be needed uh, and show completion of those follow-up actions so it's a general framework flexible analytics that allow driving that a flexible platform where all of your data is one location so that you're not constantly frustrated and unable to generate the dashboard you need because you don't have access to the data. So um, those are the the principles. Um, so yes, uh, we've been talking about activities that are really focused on a, a particular study filing offer, often. But I think as we progress with this, as we have more and more data available across a clinical program, for example, we're going to start thinking of ways to accelerate clinical development by asking those questions and seeing those signals emerge across clinical trials. And uh, perhaps this ties in with some of the, uh, um, 
DTC trials where, or, or trials where we don't have defined clinical sites, for example, remote patients, whatever. And um, <clears throat> that flexibility is going to really start driving us towards thinking less about um, study by study performance and more about our eventual goal, which is approval, which is finding drugs that work. And, and are effective and safe. So um, <clears throat> I, I think that flexibility and integrated environment are two important concepts that we want to aspire to. Great. Appreciate it, Philip. Uh, lots of questions coming in, so um, I'll try to sort of see if we can if we can get through as many as we possibly can. Um, uh, uh, sort of in this, we'll keep on that same topic of sample management because the next question was uh, sample shipped. Where is this coming from? Uh, is this, uh, if the, the date time is in the EDC, they are assumed shipped? Um, yeah, so it's a very specific question in that case. I would say um, uh, much like sort of a, a preceding question, uh, much like the preceding question, right? Um, yes, the, it depends on the specific use. So a lot of the uh, customers we work with, uh, these data would come from RTSM, um, and uh, generally uh, will represent what data is presented to us, right? But in some cases, right, we ha we do work with some uh, EDCs and CDMSs um, or uh, external vendors that will provide um, the sample shipped uh, audit record um, that, that shows the back and forth um, uh, between sites. So again, it really depends. Uh, it it's, it's, uh, depends on the source, I think, is the, is the answer to the question. Uh, and it goes back to sort of um, some of the other questions we have here and uh, one of our previous comments that we work with with any and all data sources, right? We, we, we are agnostic and sort of pride ourselves on being able to connect to each of those. And I think that would be, a, a, again, a key characteristic you should be looking for in an analytics platform for yourself. Um, and that'll dovetail into sort of, you know, again, like, you know, the, the next question, you know, what EDCs and platforms can this tool be integrated with? Again, we, uh, um, uh, it depends on the particular use case, but as I just said, we're, we're agnostic to, to, the, uh, to the data source. Um, and uh, in worst case, if, we, if, it, if there's some sort of, uh, um, uh, some sort of inhibiting factor, um, be it security or as, a, as, a, as externally held, um, uh, and an outside uh, vendor, um, we can all we can always work with uh, with flat files as well, or connect to sort of a uh, a file transfer protocol. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, next question: uh, Does the tool have an audit trail, and can be retrospective information be accessed? Um, Yes, um, uh, the so again it goes back to um, my my uh, comment I made a moment ago. Uh, we reflect the data that that is presented to us, right? Our 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 objective is not to create data. Uh, it does sort of track you know who's accessing the system and has access controls around that. But in terms of like, I'm assuming the question is more around being able to look at sort of EDC audit data. Um, in that case, we can certainly represent that, and there are, and there is a um plenty of of value to be had in terms of being able to track um and see you know uh see your data uh changing right um and who's changing it when it's changing it, it's important to have sort of from that audit data to be able to represent cycle times how long is it taken to change and then from that you can you can build out a variety of sort of analytics to say uh which uh what other repeat offenders in terms of what forms are most frequently being changed and why, um, or if you can from that drill down to maybe sites that are sort of uh, are uh, are have uh, uh, constantly sort of uh, changing the data. Um, Philip, anything else you want to say sort of on on audit uh, audit data? Um, I, I think you've covered it really well. The yes, certainly there's audit information, and um, <clears throat> I'm I'm sort of thinking of two things at once here so i apologize the uh what what is what i'm thinking about is that the the importance uh i'm sorry i just lost my thread of thought go ahead no worries um 
I'll, 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 uh, I'll let you think about it and we'll move on to the next question. Um, uh, can the EDC be tagged to raise potential queries directly from this tool? Um, the, the, the answer to that question is we're releasing that capability actually um, for various EDCs um, over time. Um, we're, we're, we're proud to say that right now we have the ability sort of to uh, uh, be able to track issues and uh, queries within the tool but then uh, the query submission back to the EDC, or we're, we're proud to say we're releasing that um, starting next month in, in July. Um, so uh, we'll continue to sort of roll that out with the, with the various different EDCs. Um, but yes, our, our goal is to sort of be able to, to uh, have that capability, uh, but it's really just kind of knocking off each of the different sort of EDCs out there. Um, so, but yes, that is, that is key capability. Sorry, Philip. Yeah, no, the, the thought came back to me, I think. Um, I was. Um, Thinking about the, the the advantages of these dashboards that we have, they're descriptive tools. They tell us what's going on in the data. They focus our attention on things that we need to pay attention to. What's the next step? So the next step is how can we uh, utilize that information? We have all of this data with domains and rules and whatever. The, that sets the table so that you can start having a system that uses that information to say auto-generate queries or uses that information not only to bring each record to the attention of the person or a collection of records that aren't compliant with, with, with a particular rule to your, uh, to your focus and attention, but actually start to try to take that next step um, and you could handle the risk maybe by having it auto generate queries that then need to be reviewed before they're submitted or you know you can think of a variety of ways to manage the risk to the initial efforts with this but um, but I do think that uh, this work understanding the data understanding the rules understanding the process that needs to take place allows you to then take start taking that next step in data science of uh, starting to drive actions forward that um, <clears throat> particularly where the action needed is not ambiguous. Thank you, Philip. Uh... Next question. Uh, we'll see if we can put this in the in the ch in the chat window uh, back. But it was a great session. Uh, uh, can, uh, where can I find the rules that are validated by the FDA? Um, like I said, we'll try to put a link. And there's a link in our presentation. So I think the presentation will will, will go out um, with the recording. Um, but if not, we'll see if we can put it in the chat window here. Uh, to ask to see if uh, David, if you could maybe see if we can put a, a link in there. But um, if you uh, also if you just Google um, FDA data validator rules 1.6. Um, you should see that as the second option, um, the first, uh, yeah, one of the first options in the uh, in the, uh, the the list there. Or contact us, and we can we can chat more. Go to our website and give us a yell. Uh, let's see. Um, I know we're rounding out the last few minutes here. Um, uh, you know what? Uh, yeah, would would Spotfire accept all the data from different data sources? Uh, yeah, I think we we answered that one. Yeah, but uh, yes, we uh, Spotfire can work with pretty much any any data source, and our Signals platform has a growing number of connectors built into it. Um, and uh, you know, provide that sort of central analysis uh, local repository for you. Um, uh, let's see, this is sort of a, a different question we'll go with. Uh, what is the key difference between risk-based monitoring and clinical data management? Right, we, I mean, we didn't, we didn't touch specifically on, on this, but um, really I would say that uh, risk-based monitoring, not, not, it should be an overlay a continuous really in your organization, not, not just clinical data management, and it shouldn't be sort of a, a standalone department or a, a, a standalone function or a one-time activity, right? Um, it should be a part of um, your critical to quality um, really process, right? That is driven um, by good clinical practices um, in identifying one, what are your risks when you are creating your study, um, but then identifying um, 
uh, uh, a mechanism to, to track those risks, right? And again, that's where data science and sort of these analytic tools can come in. Uh, so once you've identified those risks, then you can do um, really it, with the same sort of repository that we're talking about and the same sort of tools, you can track those risks and then be able to then um, uh, uh, not only uh, see, what the, see, what the, see what the risks are um, and what the progress is against this risk, but you can then also um, uh, track and, and create decisions around around this, right? So when you take a you take an action, you can record what that action is, and then see what the uh, what the reaction is. So it helps you be more proactive and also create an audit record. Um, Philip, yeah, uh, I, anything else you want to add? I just wanted to add that the risk-based monitoring principles can certainly be applied to any of these dashboards. To any of these questions that you're asking. So risk-based monitoring has a, a, a traditional EDC focus for prioritizing those things that are of greatest risk. The same could be done to any of the FDA validation rules. How do you prioritize those rules which are for your study the most important to make sure? Uh, that's a little bit of a trivial example. A more Consequential example might be to look at medical questions related to the clinical program and trying to that that and you've got a, a, a tool for monitoring medical review and capturing medical uh, signals and and now you want a risk based approach towards defining how those m impact the program and so I I think it risk-based monitoring is an important concept because everything's about risk ultimately and um, risk to the patient, risk of disease. And so um, <clears throat> how do you best apply those principles uh, in whatever system you can develop to help you do your work better? Great, thank you, Philip. Um... We've got a few minutes left, so I'll, I'll see if we can round out with one more question there. And uh, if we didn't get to your question, um, please reach out to us um, um, uh, through our website, um, uh, and we'll uh, we'll get back to you, or we'll see if we can work with the SCDM folks to get back to you as well. Um, but final question uh, that I see here, Phillips came in during a section of your presentation that they commented on and says, uh, how can uh, series adverse event reconciliation be accelerated using a uh, dashboard. Philip, I'll, 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 let, I'll let you start with that one. I'm, I'm just going to kind of wing this because I haven't actually um, done it, but um, I've worked a lot with both systems, of course. I would put, pull in data from the SAE database. Uh, it's going to consist of severe adverse event information, and I would do record comparison with uh, adverse event information from the AE domain for that study and um, compare serious flags and um, uh, whatever other questions you need to do as part of the reconciliation. And my expectation would be that that would pretty quickly get to a point where you could actually start predicting what actions are needed if there's an incompatibility. So I, I do think that's actually a, a nice project to work on. Very much agree. I think there's 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 lots of uh, room there for data science to be able to sort of automate uh, the comparison between uh, two databases um, that can be trained, you know, over time to sort of further improve and sort of bring humans into the loop on 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 that reconciliation process. So I think it'd be less of a dashboard. I think that, that's sort of a component of it. But I think having sort of uh, you know a, a machine learning algorithm that would just sort of continue to learn off of off of uh, humans actions in that reconciliation process um, but that said i'll say i, I uh, will end it there um and uh i really appreciate your time um and joining us um and i'll turn it back over to carolina to, to wrap us up but thank you again for your time
perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for participating participating in today's webinar. And of course, Brent, David, and Philip, thank you for the interesting webinar and for trying to answer as many questions as possible. I see there's one more question in the question box. Uh, will we have access to this presentation as a recording or uh, slides? So this recording will be added to the learning platform. So if you wish to rewatch it, um, probably next week it will be added to the platform. So um, yes, it will be possible. Um, so yes, so thank you all for joining, uh, wishing you a great day and I hope to see you on our future webinars. Thank you all. Bye-bye.